the Gospel by John, and at the 15th chapter, just reading the first five verses, it's one of the most masterly, shall I say, matchless messages the Master ever gave. You will notice at the end of chapter 14, in the last verse, verse 31, he's speaking to his own. They're in the upper room. You remember in chapter 13, he washed their feet there and Judas left the scene. And then he had something wonderful to say to the apostles about his coming again. And at the end of chapter 14, he's still in the upper room, but leaving it now. It says, but that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Arise, let us go hence. You know, he's walking out of this room deliberately, going, of course, first of all, to the Garden of Gethsemane, knowing right well that he will be arrested there and taken to Pilate's Hall into the hands of wicked men, as he had forecast, and that Calvary is not too far away. But going boldly, courageously, in fact, I think the most courageous man this world has ever seen. And as he steps out of the upper room, and I know whereabouts it was in the city of Jerusalem, and he comes down the narrow streets, I believe that he would cross the courtyard or the court of the temple. He would go in through one of the gates and cross right across the court. He would go out through the beautiful gate of the temple on the other side of the court and then go down the valley of Jehoshaphat and across the Kidron and down into the Garden of Gethsemane. Now it's somewhere along the line that he preaches this masterly message. I have a feeling, I don't know of course, that when he got into the temple court, that he might have stopped his disciples and said, now I want to say something to you. And then he began this great message. He said, I am the true vine. And every time our Lord Jesus Christ said, I am, he was revealing a sufficiency. A sufficiency that can meet the need that stands before him. He says, I am. It's a revelation of a sufficiency. It's a great study, of course, to go through John's Gospel and watch every time he said it. When he was looking into the eyes of 5,000 people who were hungry, who had followed him for ever so many hours, he said, I am the bread of life. And he was revealing that he could meet the need. Of course, he who gives to us millions of acres of corn and wheat and barley, he who feeds the cattle on a thousand hills, bless God, he's the bread of life. He is quite sufficient to meet the need of that multitude. You remember when he was looking into the eyes of the blind man, a man who had been blind from birth, who had been in the dark all his life, Looking into these blind eyes, he said, I am the light of the world. He's revealing a sufficiency that can meet this deep, dire, desperate need. You remember when he stood at the grave of Lazarus, Martha and Mary are weeping nearby, looked round at them, he said, I am the resurrection. And the life, it's a revelation that I can meet the need. And there isn't any need that you are ever going to experience that he cannot meet. He's the all-sufficient one, meet every need. And he's stopping here and taking a breath and looking into the eyes of these disciples. They now know that he's going away from them. He has told them in John 14. If I go, they know he's going, and they just wonder how they'll live without him. How will life 
ponder out if you go. And he's beginning to reveal to them now, I'm the sufficiency for life. I'm the true vine. Oh, there's all in me that you need to live and produce to the glory of God. So he's just revealing the sufficiency that's in himself for life. But he brings another note in as he gets on with the message. He said, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. You see, while he's revealing his own sufficiency, he's revealing the father's expectancy. He says, you know, the father expects you fellows to produce something in life that will glorify him. And he says, of course, I'm the sufficiency for that. If the Father expects this, I'm the sufficiency. Of course, this brings immediately to us the responsibility of every branch. Yes, we're responsible, aren't we? We're responsible at one end of the branch to take from the sufficiency. And we're responsible at the other end of the branch to produce the life that will satisfy God. And Christ is the sufficiency we need for this production. But he said this to them as he went on with the message. He said, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he, the Father, taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Not only showing us the sufficiency of himself and the expectancy of the Father and the responsibility of the branches, but the ability of the word. We are cleansed through the word. And then he comes to the bit that I'm after this morning. He said, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. And that's the phrase I'm after. Without me you can do nothing. It's a tremendous statement, you know, when you begin to think about it. You know, sometimes when the Jehovah Witnesses or Millennial Donists or Russellites or whatever they like to call themselves or they change it so often, when they come along and they look into my eyes and they say, can you prove that Jesus Christ was God? That gives me the greatest pleasure in the world to take any one of them on at any time for such a thing. And I have about a hundred ways of doing it now and I amuse myself with them. Because it would be quite simple to go back to Bethlehem and know that the, the child that was born and the son that was given, that his name is the mighty God. But this is a text they don't like. It's quite easy to see that the child was God. Quite easy to switch to the great judgment morning and see Christ as the judge for all judgment is given unto the Son. And to hear the book saying, the small and great stood before God. Because the judge is God. It's quite easy to read Paul's letter and know that the king is God. The king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God. It's quite easy to see Thomas kneeling at the feet of Christ and looking into his eyes and saying, My Lord and my God, as the Lord is God, the child is God, the judge is God, the king is God. Uh, that's a line you can take. There's, there's a hundred more. Here's one that they don't know very much about when I tackle it. The sayings of Christ. Christ said certain things. And if he wasn't God, he shouldn't have said them. You know, once when he was looking into the eyes of a multitude of sinners, 
And he can see them. And he knows where they come from. He knows their ages, their homes, their problems. He knows that the crowd that stand around them, they're burdened. Burdened by so many things. And they're bewildered in life. And they're baffled. And he openly said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And if he's not God, he shouldn't talk like that. For a mere man to stand before a multitude of people and say, Come unto me and I will give you rest. It's baloney. He needs to be God who talks like this. I couldn't say to this congregation, much as I would love to, Bring me all your burdens and I'll give you rest. I can't do it. I'm a mere mortal. So that Jesus Christ, looking into the eyes of sinners and saying, Come unto me. And at that moment he knew that this great message would be recorded. And through the inspired New Testament and Gospels, it would go to every country in the world. And countless thousands, yea, millions, have heard the cry, Come unto me! I will give you rest. And every time they have come, he has taken their burden away. It's to be God. And when a man looks into the eyes of disciples and says, I want you to get this, without me, you can do nothing. He needs to be God. My friends, that's a mighty statement. Don't you make any mistakes about it. I couldn't dare to say to anyone here, without me, you can't get on. You can get on rightly without me. And if God took me away today, you'll get on without me. But Jesus Christ can say, without me, you can do nothing. I tell you, I can bring you I twenty statements that Christ made that proves he's God. And the Russellites are afraid to tackle them. Oh, I would have no problems with them, you know. I can manage them any day they like to come. Friend, this is a mighty statement. You know, you can take this statement and you can apply it to sinners. Without Christ. You sinners will know nothing about salvation. Without Christ, you can't get salvation. You know, I was asked by a millionaire once to go to his home one evening to meet a barrister and his younger son, who was a KT, just to have an argument with him. And they wanted to argue about the scriptures, so they said. And it was a great joy for me to go along and take them on. And the old barrister was more wily than his son. He said to me, you know, this matter of salvation. He said, you know, I believe that men in the Mohammedan religion will find salvation through Muhammad. I don't think that the multitudes that follow Confucius will all be lost. No, he said, I believe that many of these will eventually get to heaven. Of course, they have different ways, but they'll get there, I believe. He began to talk about different religions in the world, and I listened to him very carefully. And I said, you know, sir, to what you have said, I have only two things to say. And one of them is this, that the Lord Jesus said... I am the way, again, revealing the sufficiency that can get sinners to heaven. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then he said this, sir. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And if you're right, he's wrong. And if you get Hindus and Muslims and Mohammedans and the followers of Confucius to heaven without him, You'll prove forever up yonder that he was a liar down here. But it's not going to happen, you know. This shook him, you know. I was taking him on good ground. And then I said, I want to say this secondly, that Peter, the great apostle, who was far more clever than you'll ever be, sir, because I don't mind bumping into these fellows when they're looking for me. 
I said, he said, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Peter, and this inspired book is wrong if you're right. And I began to tear him apart limb by limb until the young fellow said to him, Father, you've met your much now. You're not able for this, sir. I said, he's not able for the truth, son. I'm not able for him, but I can manage him to the book. Friend, here is a mighty statement. He's looking into the eyes of his own. He's saying, without me, ye can do nothing. And that means nothing. You see, he's talking to them here about production of life. A life that will glorify God. The husband, man, the father is looking down at all the branches, all the believers. And he wants to see in our lives something of the beauty and grandeur and greatness of his son. Well, let me tell you, it can't be produced apart from Christ. Paul talks, you know, about I live, yet not I. It is Christ that liveth in me. This is the only way it can be produced. It's not my brains or my ability or my intelligence or my this or my that or my anything. It's a blessed moment when your life, when you learn three things, when you learn, first of all, that you're nothing to begin with. I am nothing. Take Christ away from me. I am a sensual sinner who got drunk every day and who would get drunk again every day apart from Christ. I played the fool. I did everything wrong. Friend, I am nothing. 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 I want to get this over to you. And not only am I nothing, but I have nothing. Oh, if I have gifts, I got them from God. What have I that I have not received? And I want to tell you this. I know I am nothing, and I know I, ha I am nothing, and I know I have nothing. But I know I can do nothing. I'm not even trying. No, I've got to trust the Lord for everything. This end of the branch has to be depending on the vine. I've got to trust him. I need his grace. I need his power. I need his wisdom. I need utterance from him. Ah, oh, they think they get it in books. It's a pity of some of them. No, 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 it's not I. It's Christ. You see, if there's to be a production at all, it must be Christ. Without Christ, I can do nothing that will glorify God. You see, the life of Christ and the fruit of the Spirit are one and the same. In case we didn't know. Because the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. And if you go over it quietly, you know, this is the life of Christ. He loved God. You know, this is what took him out of the upper room and the way down to Gethsemane and onto the cross, that the world may know that I love the Father. And you know, when you think of some of our friends who have made great sacrifices and have gone down the Amazon, if you like, and other parts of the world, it's because they love. They love God. That's why. It's there, you know. God looks down on it, and he sees a reflection of the love of Christ. And you know, we need joy. <laughs> love, joy. My last night, you know, I preached at Ballymena Town Hall, and a big son and a big daughter brought their old mother, nice old lady, well-educated, well-to-do, all the rest of it. She came into the inquiry room with me. She said, my son saved, my daughter saved, I can't get saved. I said, I told you, you can't get saved. I know I can't get saved. She said, I've tried for weeks. Oh, I said, dear, you're on the wrong track. You don't get saved by trying. My dear, who taught you that? I said, you get saved by trusting. There's all the difference between trying and trusting. Are you trying to do it? She said, help me. I said, you know, I went over the whole story, but the gospel, can't go into it now. And we came to the place where I showed her 
that Christ had died and was risen and he was waiting for and they said him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out I said do you think that if you made an effort by faith to come to him and that just simply means sh shutting your eyes and lifting your soul to the risen Lord and say I'm coming to you would he take you in and see a dilly dallying for a minute or two you know I said, I'll tell you what we'll do. Let's get down on your knees together and I'll tell you it all over again. Put down your knees, put my arm around him and said, now listen. Went over it all again. I said, you know, he's saying, him that cometh to me. I said, no, my scatter. And then she gripped me to the arm and there are marks on it this morning. I think I was in the wrestling match or something. And she gripped me and she held it tight. She said, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. You sure now, I said. Oh, she said, I'm in, man, I'm in. What joy. Oh, John. And I'll tell you, at that moment, there was joy in heaven. And when I brought an old mother out to her big son, you know, you could see the big tears, and he just grabbed her. Oh, he said, great. She said, son of him, of him. This was all she got, you know, she was in. She's in forever. Ah, yes. You know, we need joy. My God looks down to see if there's any joy in our lives. And we need peace. And Ulster needs peace. Has real peace. And we'll get peace when Christ is seen. My, we need to have peace in our minds. Peace that passes all understanding. And you know, there's many things that come against us. And we need this long suffering. And this gentleness and this goodness. And if you were built the way I'm built from my early days, you would need Christ to have long suffering and gentleness and goodness. Yes. And you know we need faith all the time. And he's the author and finisher of faith. And I can't have it without him. We need faith. We need meekness. My, when you learn it's not you at all and that you're no use and you're no good. And there's nothing in you keeps you humble. You're nobody. Many a time I say this as I look in the glass. You are nobody. Christ is everything. It's all Christ. Yes, and we need balance all the time. We need temperance in everything. You know, I was thrilled in the prayer meeting this morning when one man prayed, Lord, we thank you for the sunshine and salvation today. Now there was good balance. Good balance it was. We need grace and truth. We need faithfulness, yet mercifulness. Friend, we can't produce the life that glorifies God except we're abiding in the vine. And be done. You know, you can't live. You know, when Paul came to the end of life, he said, I have fought. Good fight. Well, you can't fight without Christ. You know, it's Christ that puts the helmet of salvation on your head to protect you in the battle. It's Christ that shod you with the peace of the gospel so that you'll be able to stand in the evil day. It's Christ that puts the shield of faith before you. It's Christ that gives you the sword of the Spirit, which is the saying of the Spirit which is the word, the saying of God. It's just a saying for that psychological moment that, and that drives the enemy back. You know, it's Christ that puts the breastplate of righteousness. It's Christ that fits you for the battle. You can't fight. Without Christ, you can't live without Christ. I'll tell you this, you can't witness without Christ. I think sometimes we get so much witnessing without Christ that people get fed up with us. You know the story of the barber who sharpened the razor and put the man's head back, he said, and you prepared to meet your God. It wasn't a good time to put the question, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, you can't just do this like this. This isn't the Lord at all. He that winneth souls is wise. If we are going to witness... Let me tell you this, you can't do it without Christ. You need Christ to tell you where to go, what to say, what to be. 
And you know, when you get to the place where you say, I'll go where you want me to go, I'll be what you want me to be, I'll do what you want me to do, then I tell you this, friend, you'll be witnessing men. You know, you can't live without Christ. You can't fight without Christ. You can't witness without Christ. And I'll tell you this, you'll never enter into the green pastures. You'll never enjoy the still waters. You'll never know what the cup running over means. You'll never know what the table spread in the wilderness unless you're abiding in Christ. You can't have it. And I'll tell you this, when it comes to the last day of Jesus' tarries and you're going through the valley, you won't go through the valley in peace. There'll be a struggle if you're not abiding in Christ wonder can we learn the lesson this morning without me you can do nothing so that I've got to turn around and I've got to trust him I've got to obey him I've got to submit to him I've got to allow him to flow through and it's Christ at that end that's my sufficiency and he comes to abide in me, he flows through in the agency of the Spirit. Yes, and the expectancy is at the other end when the Father sees what the Spirit has done and the life of Christ is produced in me. Oh, well, let's get the whole of it this morning. Take the text. Go on down into the week with it. And when you're going to pray, I hope you'll hear him saying without me, you can't do it. And when you're going to do any little service for the Lord, without me you can't do it. You Sunday school teachers can't do it today without Christ. I dare not go to this big meeting tonight on my own. I've got a thousand messages. I can preach them like that. Look, but well dare me. I'll have to get alone today with the Lord. What do you want? What do you want me to do? What do you want me to say? Friend, let's learn this. Oh, if we were abiding in Christ, we would make an impact. There would be a radiation. There would be a declaration, a proclamation. And the world would see Christ again in us. This is what our nation needs. In this hour, this is the sufficiency that we believers need. May the world see Jesus in us. Bless you. It may be in the valley where countless dangers hide. It may be in the sun.
But if it be my portion to bear my cross and all, while others bear their burdens beyond the will of song, I'll prove my faith in Him, confess His judgment's hand, and if thank thee for thy presence, part us, those who must go, in thy fear, and with thy blessing, for thy holy name's sake. Amen. Thank you for watching this video. Feel free to like this video and subscribe to this channel, to stay up to date, with new videos as they come online.